If you studied undergraduate organic chemistry and you were paying attention during lectures, there's a good chance you'll have heard of desmartin periodinane or triacetyl iodoxybenzoic acid. It's an oxidising agent containing iodine in the plus 5 oxidation state. Both it and its precursor IBX, which is 2-iodoxybenzoic acid, can selectively oxidise alcohols to aldehydes without overrunning to the acid, which is the reaction that got desmartin periodinane into the textbooks. Besides this, they can aromatise nearly aromatic nitrogen heterocycles, hydroxylate ketones in the alpha position, form quinones from 1,2 or 1,4 diphenols and phenol methyl ethers, oxidise 1,3 diethines back to carbonyls without having to use mercury, and even turn unsubstituted carbons at the benzylic position into aldehydes and ketones. The preparation of desmartin periodinane was first reported in 1983, making it a relatively new addition to the toolbox of organic chemistry reagents. IBX was first reported 90 years earlier in 1893, and until recent times it was mostly seen as a curiosity due to its near total insolubility in organic solvents other than DMSO, and the fact it has a reputation for being explosive under certain conditions. More on that at the end. For various reasons, both IBX and desmartin periodinane are shockingly expensive to buy. However, the synthesis of IBX is relatively easy and amateur accessible, and that's what I'll be demonstrating in this video. Preparing desmartin periodinane itself needs a whole load of acetic anhydride, which I can't buy and is a pain in the ass to make. Despite the big difference in solubility, desmartin periodinane and IBX are for the most part functionally identical. The starting material is anthranilic acid. This is not easy for amateurs to find because it's used in the illicit manufacture of methaqualone. Its zester, methyl anthranilate, is much easier to find as it's used as a fragrance ingredient and a flavouring agent, and there are plenty of websites that cater to fragrance home crafters. Nile Red famously made methyl anthranilate from plastic gloves with anthranilic acid as the final intermediate. I didn't have the time or the patience to reproduce that process myself, so I just bought some instead. The easiest way to make anthranilic acid from methyl anthranilate was to hydrolyse the ester with caustic soda. I did this on a scale of 0.2 moles. The reagents used were methyl anthranilate, 30.2 grams, deionized water, 125 grams, caustic soda, 8.2 grams, and glacial acetic acid, 14 grams. Water was weighed into a beaker and caustic soda was dissolved in it. Methyl anthranilate was added to the mixture and heated with vigorous stirring. Over around 20 minutes as the temperature approached 80 degrees, the mixture slowly turned clear as the ester was hydrolyzed into sodium anthranilate. Once it was completely clear, the temperature was held at 80 degrees for a minute, then glacial acetic acid was added to the mixture, causing it to darken. The temperature was held at 80 degrees until solids started appearing at the surface. Once they started occurring, the heat was removed and the mixture was cooled to room temperature, causing the product to precipitate. The mixture was cooled in the fridge overnight, and the product was recovered on the pump as 32.2 grams of very fine off-white needles. As this represented the yield of 118%, it was clear that the product was still very wet, but as it was by far the least brown anthranilic acid I've ever obtained from this reaction, I decided not to push my luck by recrystallising it, and instead pressed on and used it as is. From past experience, the actual yield was likely to have been near quantitative. Using a stronger acid than acetic would have formed the acidic salt of anthranilic acid instead of the acid itself. Like the alkaline salt, the acidic salt is much more soluble in water than the acid, and much harder to crystallise. The temperature was held at 80 degrees instead of boiling point because the solubility of anthranilic acid in water increases considerably between 80 and 100 degrees, meaning a lot more water has to be boiled off for it to crystallise. It also oxidises in water at high temperature, and the longer it's spent in solution the more brown and discoloured it becomes. The next step was to turn anthranilic acid into 2-iodobenzoic acid by diazotasing the amine group and reacting it with potassium iodide. The reagents used were anthranilic acid, that's everything from the last step, 15% sulfuric acid, that's 260 grams in total. Deionized water, 30 grams. Sodium nitrite, 13.8 grams. Potassium iodide, 33.2 grams. Sodium thiosulfate, 8 grams. Methanol, isopropyl alcohol, acetone, and plenty of ice. Anthranilic acid was suspended in 130 grams of sulfuric acid, then cooled in the fridge. Sodium nitrite was dissolved in 30 grams of water, then cooled in the fridge. When both mixtures were sufficiently cold, the anthranilic acid suspension was placed in an ice bath and the sodium nitrite solution was added to it dropwise, making sure to keep the temperature below 10 degrees. While this has been carried out, potassium iodide was dissolved in 130 grams of sulfuric acid, creating a solution of hydroiodic acid. 
Once the nitrite addition was complete, I resisted the temptation to use the hydroiodic acid to make illegal drugs, and instead I added it to the mixture, causing it to turn dark, form some nitrogen dioxide fumes, and form elemental iodine. With some caution, I started heating it up. The mixture started effervescing as nitrogen was released from the disonium salt, and I soon found the beaker was a bit too small to contain the head of iodine foam that started building up, which I had to stir manually to disperse. After the mixture had stopped foaming, I heated it to 60 to 65 degrees and held it there until effervescence ceased, it was about 20 minutes, and the products precipitated from the mixture as dark brown and red solids. Any remaining iodine was neutralised with sodium thiosulfate, and the mixture was heated to 90 degrees, which not only cleared up any unreacted start material, but also caused the product to lose much of its dark colour, which was most likely due to residual iodine. Since the mixture smelt strongly of sulphur dioxide, I'm guessing that was the active reducing agent. On cooling, the crude product was recovered on the pump as pale orange powder. A tent was made to recrystallise it from methanol, 40 grams, isopropyl alcohol, 120 grams, acetone, 30 grams, and water, 30 grams. The recrist started out sensibly with the intention of simply dissolving the product in methanol and then adding enough water to precipitate it out, but there was some unknown yet yeah, ill material that just refused to dissolve in the alcohols and acetone, which I removed by decanting most of the solution, filtering out the last bit, cooling overnight and recovering the handful of solids on the pump. Another 250 grams of water was added to the filtrate and the mixture was boiled down until it became turbid. Crystals soon formed as it cooled. After cooling in the fridge overnight, the product was recovered and dried on the pump as 46.6 grams of very fine orange needles, giving an overall yield of 94% with respect to methyl anthranilate. Although this is another textbook reaction and a staple of teaching labs, there are one or two elements about it that are often overlooked. From experience, the key to minimising side reactions is to dissolve potassium iodide in sulfuric acid before adding it to the mixture. If it's dissolved in water instead, the pH changes suddenly when it's added, causing partial decomposition of the disonium salt and a loss of product. The other key element is temperature control. If the mixture is heated too fast too soon, the disonium salt reacts with water instead of iodide, and salicylic acid is formed instead. For the recrist, I should really have first dissolve the crude product in a caustic soda solution, filtered out any insoluble material, then reacidified it to purify it, and only then should I have tried to recrystallise it. But hindsight's a wonderful thing. In any case, this is the highest purity product and the best yield that I've ever managed to get from this reaction. In the last step, which forms IBX itself, the iodine in the 2 iota benzoic acid is oxidised from minus 1 to plus 5. Traditionally, this was done with potassium bromate, but a 1999 paper by Frigerio, Sant'Agostino and Sputari showed this can be done efficiently with oxone. This is a powerful and remarkably cheap oxidising agent based on potassium monoposulfate that's readily available as non-chlorine pill shock. It also has the advantage that unlike the bromate oxidation, it doesn't produce elemental bromine during the reaction, which is nasty stuff, especially at high temperatures. Reagents used were 2 iodobenzoic acid, which is 46.7 grams, oxone, which is 180 grams, deionized water, 700 grams, and acetone. Oxone was dissolved in water and heated with stirring to 70 degrees. 2 iota benzoic acid was added to this mixture, which was held at 70 to 75 degrees for 3 hours. Temperature control is critical here. If the reaction temperature gets too high for too long, IBX decomposes into 2 iodose benzoic acid and other unwanted products. As the reaction proceeded, the suspended solids slowly lost their colour. After 3 hours was up, the reaction mixture was cooled to room temperature, then cooled in the fridge overnight. The product was collected on the pump as fine pale yellow needles, then washed generously with water and acetone, removing unreacted starting material and the vast majority of residual impurities, and also drying the product while it was on the pump. Any solid product left over this point, which was completely insoluble in water or acetone, was almost certainly IBX. The final yield was 35.2 grams, which is 67% with respect to 2 iota benzoic acid, and 63% overall with respect to methyl anthranilate. This is in line with the original paper. The severe oxidising conditions and the washing steps at the end mean that this reaction is remarkably forgiving to less than pure starting material. In previous runs I'd started with less pure and more discoloured iodine benzoic acid and carried out a purification step by dissolving the material in caustic soda and reacidifying it at 70 degrees, but this was not needed here. Now, IBX has a reputation for being explosive at high temperatures, over 200 degrees. It deflagrates from an open flame and reacts energetically with aluminium on heating, but in my experience it does not actually detonate. In any case, it only requires mild reaction conditions to work as an oxidant and temperatures stay well within two figures. It's also been claimed that IBX is shock sensitive. 
This is probably more true of the bromate made material, which likely contains impurities that act as fuel. I took some of the octone made materials and brayed the hell out of it with an hammer on a concrete floor and I couldn't set it off at all. It also seemed to be in sensitive direction. So, in conclusion, Desmartin Periodonine may get all the glory, in the textbooks at least, but IBX is worthy in its own right, and when made this way, it appears to be nowhere near as dangerous as its reputation suggests. To my knowledge, there are very few other organic oxidising agents which are this amateur accessible and relatively easy to make, and personally, I found the elegant simplicity of these reactions makes them very satisfying to carry out. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching.